What's your sign, Rio? My sign is no parking. Now let's get a move on. Released in 2003 in Japan and 2004 in the West, Lifeline is a voice action adventure title for the PlayStation 2, a game which you guide a character through voice commands. Sounds frustrating, doesn't it? Well, it is. There's something utterly fascinating with Lifeline. There are interesting and clever systems at play here, like the combat system. The story and character you're guiding take a whole different shape and feel compared to a more traditional game. With how much technology has advanced in the last 20 years, I would love to see how a game like Lifeline could play today. It's a game where the technology was not quite there with the ambitions they had. This results in goofy moments and some downright frustrating ones, but there are plenty of moments where its charm shines through. Wear the sunglasses. There's no need to wreck it. I didn't say shoot them. Examine the sunglasses. It's a fascinating and unique title that I can compare to few other experiences. Like other PS2 titles I've covered on the channel, I used the PC SX2 emulator for capturing footage. I upscaled the resolution and used a widescreen patch. I had concerns at first if I could get the game to run properly. This game is an outlier in the PS2 library due to voice commands. And at first, those concerns came to life. I tried the most up-to-date nightly build of PCSX2 with the mic you're hearing now, a Shure MD7. I was able to get Lifeline to recognize the mic. Recognizing my words? That was a different story. The tutorial must be pretty slack, as I got through it with no problem. The first combat encounter took me nearly 10 minutes to defeat one enemy. And that's even trying the R's as L's, as this is a Japanese-developed game. Like saying Dodge Reft instead of Dodge Left. One memorable four-player podcast clip demonstrates this. Hey, Ro! Bad. Hey, Ro! Good! <laughs> now try the next one. PlayStation! Great! <laughs> now try the next one. Rife Ryan! Good! <laughs> I came across a guide on how they got the game to work with PCSX2. Instead of using the most up-to-date version, I used the 1.60 stable build and that worked. If you're interested in trying out Lifeline, I include a link in the description and pinned comment. I bought a $20 Logitech USB headset for a more authentic experience. So throughout this video, you're going to hear some quality changes in my mic. And this worked. For the most part, there were many frustrations along the way. That said, it was nice to use a USB headset for the first time in ages. Many fond memories of talking smack over Xbox Live. There's some odd comfort in listening back to these conversations over low quality mics. The only thing I want, one, one, that's, do get rid of the only thing I'll be playing is Rumble Fit. Yeah, I saw that, I'm gonna try to get back up. Or they're bringing back, uh, head to head too. They're bringing his head back. That would be so freaking sick. Another note, what impacted my experience with Lifeline is that I streamed most of the game. I'll have the links to the streams if you're interested. We had a riot with it, particularly the first stream. The second stream saw me descending into madness and genuine anger with combat frustrations. Overall, it made the game more enjoyable compared to if I just played it by myself. With that, let's get Lifeline going, or Operator's Side as it's called in Japan. We start with the narrator talking about the 16th century European physician Paracelsus. Not only was he one of the era's finest medical minds, he also made contributions in alchemy, astrology, astronomy, and mysticism. What does this have to do with anything? Well, that comes later. The story goes in some wild, unexpected directions. The date is December 24th, 2029. So we have a Christmas game on our hands. A time frame that's underused in games. There's a Wikipedia entry for Christmas video games with 61 entries. For the Konami connection, as this title was published by Konami in the West, Hideo Kojima used the Christmas time frame in a couple of games. Metal Gear 2 takes place on Christmas Eve. Snatcher takes place around Christmas. Back to Lifeline, the game takes place at the JSL Space Station Hotel. We play as the Operator. Awakening in the monitor room with a wound, we watch some footage of what happened earlier in the night. The Japanese Prime Minister is giving a talk at the grand opening of the hotel. We're there with our girlfriend Naomi. I can't believe we're spending Christmas in space. Thank you. However, the party's attacked. What are these? Monsters? Are they aliens? We get a message from a woman locked up the waitress who asked us at the party if we wanted a drink. I finally got through. 
Finally, my efforts pay off. Good evening. Would you like a cocktail? We have the ability to unlock doors where we are, so we let her out. She's ready to venture out on her own, but is attacked by one of the creatures. We help her out, and she suggests we partner up. We guide her through the station, and she can find our girlfriend Naomi and something else that she's looking for. What she's after, she won't say at this point. Or this is where the game ends. My first try getting the game to work ended in failure, when it wouldn't recognize my voice commands and she thought I refused her offer. Yeah, you're stuck where you are. You. Yeah, you're stuck where you are. I will work with but you. But you cannot. Yeah, you're stuck where you are. I will work with you. But think about it. I need your help as an operator. Okay. Okay, I understand. I won't ask you again. Goodbye. <laughs> this is Ryo. We'll use voice commands to guide her through the ship and help her in combat. The game lives or dies on how well the voice commands work and how likable Ryo is. And despite my many frustrations on the voice command front, they did succeed in making her likable. She's voiced by Kristen Miller. Around this time frame, she voiced Lisa in Team America World Police. I know it's hard, Gary, but you're still the only hope to stop these newer terrorists. It's something that the hotel loans to the guests. It has a combination lock on it. She's kind and caring, and she's got some spunk to her. She isn't afraid to dish things back at others, including ourselves. Take a shower. What? Take a shower? <laughs> mm -mm, not in your lifetime. Nearly everything she does requires our guidance. We tell her where to go in a room and what to interact with. Each room is mapped out, so it's easy to tell her which point to move to. We can bring up a list of vocal commands to use in-game, very handy to have, and dig into further topics with consultations, like what happened on the ship prior, key people, or about herself. Tell me about yourself. Um, I'm half German and half Japanese. My age, measurements, and hobbies are my business. Occupation? Waitress. Will that do? There are a few hidden voice commands as Easter eggs. Bark like a dog. Little dog? Arf! Arf! Or big dog? Woof! Woof! <laughs> I'd love to hear that conversation and development where they decide to make bark like a dog a hidden command. Throughout Lifeline, we could find additional voice commands on sheets of paper. Some for combat, some outside of combat. Some useful, some more for a laugh. What is this? This word. Sexy pose, it says. <laughs> Sexy pose. What, like this? <laughs> you can unlock games to play with her. Um, category is... Cities with pro football teams. Here we go. Official United States holidays. Summer Olympic events. U.S. states. Go. Oh, she rubs it in your face if she wins. You already said that one. Oh. I win. Oh, what? I don't get The go total up till now is... I seem to be doing better. I won't lose. And there were several cases where it felt like the game cheated. There's no way it didn't pick up my answers here. One of the games we could play is Tongue Twister. I had no idea that the She Sells Seashells Tongue Twister had a second part to it. She sells seashells on the seashore. Seashells she sells or seashells she is sure. <laughs> okay, your turn. I don't know that whole other part. She sells seashells by the seashore. Uh, she... what was it? Haha, <laughs> nice try, but you blew it. But I somehow tricked the game into thinking I said it correctly. She sells seashells on the seashore. Seashell, seashells, it's assured. Shit. Awesome. <laughs> Repeat after me. As Ryu carries a gun for combat, there's a lot of fun asking her to shoot various objects. Most objects she won't shoot, but there are exceptions, some quite surprising. Shoot the corpse. Could you really do that? Shoot a dead person? I absolutely refuse. Shoot the meal. Didn't your mother tell you to never waste food? Let's not. Shoot coffee. <laughs> Oops. I missed. Rio's going to have a lot of bad luck with all the mirrors we can ask her to shoot, but it does come in handy at one point. Something's written on the wall. 
029. I wonder what this number is. Of course, there are a number of frustrations and flaws with the game recognizing vocal commands. There are a number of cases where you have to be very specific in your guidance, like a note on the table. What? That doesn't work? How about a letter? If you're close enough, she'll ask more about it and will give you the name to use. This here on the desk is an invitation. I don't think I would have thought of that otherwise. The biggest frustration is when you ask her to search amongst a number of the same object, like doors, lockers, vending machines. On a frequent basis, I could get her to check all of them save for one, which would take a couple of tries turns into a couple of minutes. And then usually I'd say forget it and move on. I might need a lifeline myself to call for help with how much my blood pressure could rise in these situations. Asking her to read this note on the leftmost locker? After three minutes of trying, I gave up. Can you please check the left locker notes? There's no point in shooting it. <laughs> oh, this is too much. Asking her to check the left glowing dispenser on the right vending machine took about three minutes. Getting her to open the last of four restroom doors, a good four minutes, in which case I gave up. This one example of asking her to read a note on a cardboard box is a nice summary of the frustrations of Lifeline and its vocal commands. Read note. Leave the room? Stop. Okay. Stop, stop, stop. The second floor. Okay. okay. Run to second floor. These moments add a decent chunk of time to your playthrough. If you're a fan of Jerma, you may have seen his stream of Lifeline. For him, it took about 15 hours. For myself, it ended up being a good 9.5. On the other side of the coin, the fastest completion time for Lifeline is around 2 hours and 36 minutes. Yes, some absolute mad lads have devoted time to speedrunning Lifeline, a title where it's very easy for the game to misread your inputs, that being your voice. Speedword, I don't know what compelled you to do so, but props to you for holding the record for Lifeline. As frustrating as these moments can be with voice commands not registering, they are manageable as they aren't life or death situations. But then there's the combat. This is where the true frustration of Lifeline lies. There there are moments where the combat system works, but that's the exception and not the norm. Which is too bad, as it is a clever system. There are a number of points Ryo can aim at with an enemy. Some are weak points. Some you need to damage first before other weak points are exposed. A great example are these plant enemies. They have long wind-ups and well-telegraphed attacks, giving you plenty of time to get your commands in and dodge. They have certain parts you need to hit before you can hit the weak point. And as the game progresses, we could find some new voice commands for combat, like auto-fire or jump. You could give multiple commands at once, like head, body, left eye, to shoot in that order. One amusing weak point one enemy has is inner mouth. Say that many times over and it takes a different connotation. Inner mouth. Inner mouth. That sounds pretty bad. Shoot. Inner mouth, inner mouth, inner mouth. Inner mouth, inner mouth, <laughs> inner mouth. Thing is, the system tends to fall apart with multiple enemies which the game loves to throw at you. Further in, they come in waves. Asking to dodge left or dodge right usually ended with Ryo dodging the other direction. When I kept that in mind and tried to say dodge left so she would dodge right, she would then dodge left. Even saying dodge reft didn't help. Getting her to change targets was my greatest frustration. In most cases, she would lock off a target altogether. Then I have to ask her to turn right or left until she locks on again. Even then, she would target the enemy halfway across the room instead of the one right in front of her. Some enemy attacks have small windows to tell Ryo to shoot this weak point or dodge. And when you have voice commands not always getting through, you'll be taking a number of hits that could have been avoided. One late game enemy requires us to either run far back enough or use the jump command to avoid a shockwave attack. It's a narrow window to get the jump timing right. And when Lifeline doesn't recognize your commands, you end up talking faster as you get more frustrated, which only makes things worse. Healing was a pain in the ass. Asking her to use a healing capsule would take several tries. At random, she would use one without me telling her to. This happened on a frequent basis. Run towards target three. Yes! Heal! I ah. This resulted in a frustrating endgame with waves of enemies attacking and Ryo with little health and no healing capsules. It got to the point where I used safe states to progress forward ever so slowly. Use capsule. Use capsule. Use the capsule. Fucking this goddamn mother... Stupid little... Oh, I don't have any heal capsules this way. Now that we've covered the gameplay, let's go through some of the major beats of Lifeline, so spoilers ahead. The first stretch of the game has us exploring various guest rooms for survivors, and finding a weapon to take out a large creature blocking our path forward. Ryo's encounters with survivors offer plenty of early 2000s cheese and charm. Besides Ryo, the voice acting is quite hammy. 
As mentioned earlier, Ryo has spunk. She isn't afraid to throw some sass around. One highlight is her talking with the manager of the hotel. I'll look for the prime minister, a jackass. But he came out of the transportation ministry and I'm screwed if he dies in my hotel. Sir? What? Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? You got a problem with it? I'm trying to help and you're being a real jerk. Save it for someone who cares, bimbo. Another great encounter Rio has with a survivor is with a researcher who's pretending to be dead. Operator, I don't think we're gonna get any information from this researcher. What couldn't you ask me? What? Stop, stop, wait a second, I'm human, don't shoot! Hey, I'm sorry, I thought that an alien had come in here. I don't have any useful weapons, so the only thing I could do was play dead. I'm Alan Honda, a researcher. Can you, uh, maybe lower that gun? <laughs> I'm, I'm human. Hey, I'll admit to being a little weird, but... <laughs> Shoot lamp. <laughs> I'm just fooling around. I won't shoot. There are some decent one-off moments of using voice commands, like saying a passage with Rio at the same time to open a door. Although, like everything here, the vocal recognition can be a bit spotty with the timing. Even, Even the, the very, very shadow, shadow that, that you cast, cast in sunlight, sunlight I, I want, want to, to monopolize. monopolize. Authentication successful. There are scenes where Rio will ask us a question. Sometimes we need to come up with a list of things. Sometimes it'll be for something specific. We need fire to defeat the large creature blocking our way forward, but the flamethrower is out of fuel. So she's trying to remember the term Molotov cocktail. Sadly, she doesn't recognize Metal Gear as a choice. Operator, can you tell me the names of weapons that you know? Metal Gear. No, no, nothing like a spear. <laughs> um... A missed opportunity was not having her react to Konami titles. Nothing to Metal Gear, Silent Hill, or Castlevania worked. Although, to be fair, the game was only published by Konami in the West. They weren't the developers of Lifeline. That was Sony Computer Entertainment. In the same room as getting supplies for a Molotov, she gives this intriguing talk about her past but keeps things vague. Please share. You're right. Everyone has them. I have them too. That memory. What sort of memory is it? It is a good memory? Or a bad memory? You tell me, is it a good memory? Rio, don't, don't hold these secrets from me. As frustrating as Lifeline can be, there is something different about using voice commands that builds a bond with her. It helped get me invested in her story as a character in a different way from other games. It does help Lifeline stand out amongst all its issues. With that, we take down the creature and move on to the next section. Things slow down in the restroom. Rio was told about an accident during the construction of the station that resulted in the death of a few staff. The restroom is said to be haunted, and she's a bit of a scaredy cat. I can't, operator. <laughs> I can't go any further here. Please. Can we stop looking here? Run to the men's stalls. Well, I know, but... So she goes extra slow as a result here, and you have a case of multiple doors to open where it takes forever to get her to open that one damn door where I had no issues with the others. And this whole thing about a haunted washroom? Turns out it was just a prank, bro. Rio. Gotcha. Hey, <laughs> was it scary? I made that story up. Huh? I thought that Rio'd fall for it and come snooping. Please bring back my pendant from Meg. A prank? <laughs> Meg was just pulling my leg. There's a funny bit where we enter a room and get hit by what looks to be a car muffler by one of the Prime Minister's crew. Sorry. Guess I didn't need you that time. Look out to the right, 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 right. What is right, it? Look right to the right. What's the matter? <laughs> Why'd you listen to me? Hold up. I'm so sorry about that. 
As someone pointed out in chat while I streamed this, why would a card muffler be here? Where did he get it from? We progress forward with them and come across a rescue crew who are here to take care of things, or so it seems. Rio gets an outfit change and a new gun. Captain! The suit? May I borrow this? That's an armored suit for combat use. I want to get changed out of these clothes. They're all sticky with sweat and uh, slime. So, okay, I can wear this, right? <laughs> Fine, go ahead. Awesome, I think. Well, that's not going to be the case soon. There's this clever if annoying puzzle in one room. You need to open one staff quarters door with a voice password. Password is what this staff member had been collecting. Candy? Yes, but you have to be more specific. You have to get Rio to eat enough candy on the table, then look at the box to realize that all strawberry candy is missing. Strawberry candy is the voice password with a funny payoff. Wow. <laughs> it's full of strawberry candies. Someone sure likes these. And then Rio comes to her lowest moment yet. She returns to her quarters to find them ruined. All my clothes. My pictures! Where are all my pictures? There's a few left. <laughs> this is... This is awful. I just... I give up. Until I tell her not to give up. And she's okay just like that. Really, Rio? This is what got you down? I expect better from you. She's come across a number of corpses and dead friends, but she got over them quickly. Oh! <laughs> this person's dead. He... he was hiding here, in hopes of finding protection. Huh? Voice password. <gasps> now we can get into the sun suite. Yeah! But this is what gets her to give up? It's not like all her pictures are missing, plus he picked up a cool combat outfit. It is a reflection of reality, something that seems minor will upset your girlfriend or spouse and you struggle to find out why. From here on in, Lifeline takes a large drop in quality on the gameplay front. Combat encounters are ramped up. They come in waves now. We're combined to narrow hallways. It makes it difficult to hit them or dodge attacks. While the game does introduce some new enemies that go well with the weapon change, they still pack them in with others in waves and in tight areas with little room for navigation. Now, I like to think of myself as an easygoing individual. In rare cases, a game can get my blood boiling. Lifeline was one of them. As the game is based around voice commands, using a tone full of anger and speaking a faster rate leads to more missed commands, which in turn leads to greater anger and even more missed commands. This in turn led to situations where she would use healing capsules when I didn't want her to. Safe scumming through safe states became the way forward. There's a challenging, amusing bit where she needs to bounce her way across some beams as we guide her. It's a great use of the voice commands and gives you just enough time to give orders. And there's something super comical about her falling. Jump across. Yep. I was meaning jump forward. We then get more insight into why Rio is on this ship and what she's looking for. Although, not the why. See the glass case in the corner of the screen? Can you see something like a ball in it? It's something that can't be there. It's something that shouldn't be there. I took the waitress job here to find out more about that round stone, but I have no clue where it's at. Wait, would you like to know more? About the stone? Yes, please. You're certain? Yes, you have my attention. That's true. It has nothing to do with you. Okay, I guess not. We have some downtime where we learn more about her family, her first word, and a shocking revelation. You might not believe me, but... <sighs> I've never had a boyfriend before. I'm a girl without a heart. But I'm beginning to understand. It's better for people to be with someone rather than being alone. Now, this did surprise me for a moment. And then I gave it more thought. Does she need commands in other situations to function? Could you imagine trying to take her on a date, trying to live with her? I mean, a common component of relationships are moments where you ask them to do something, but they don't quite get the memo. But Rio takes it to a whole other level. When we get back to Earth, maybe I'll get you to introduce me to someone. Please remain seated until the safety bar has been lifted. Well, then again, what about you? 
<laughs> but I suppose there's no chance of that, huh? What is she implying here? Does she want to swoop in and steal us away from Naomi? A threesome? They could have structured the game in a different way. Where there was no Naomi, where the operator was single. Over time, the connection between you and Ryo can end with a relationship at the end of the game. Although, like Sandra Bullock said at the end of Speed, relationships that start under intense circumstances never last. We're now in the end stretch and the game ramps down on gameplay, but ramps up on cutscenes. This stone or orb that Ryo's looking for? This now ties back to the beginning cutscene with Paracelsus and the Philosopher's Stone. Are you familiar with the Philosopher's Stone? It is said to have been in the possession of Paracelsus a 16th century European philosopher. Capable of generating intense healing power, it was a stone that defied human comprehension. It was studied by some scholars of the time. But despite lengthy research, their efforts were in vain. At long last, however, we have succeeded in reproducing the philosopher's stone. This is it. Turns out researchers have created a stone that produces the opposite effects. The Philosopher's Stone heals, and this stone curses organisms. All these creatures on the ship? No, they're not aliens. Some are animals affected by the stone. Other monsters that we've come across are humans affected by the stone. It's not a rescue crew on board, but those coming for the stones. I love the voiceover about these stones, and how casual corpo the woman is speaking. Like it's a bullet point on marketing material. A number of possible results of the use of this stone can be imagined. But the most effective is the use of an accursed hex capable of plunging a civilized society into chaos. This very stone has been spared in order that your country may carry out its plan of battle. And we believe that this is the only measure available. So how did Rio know about this stone? Why is she here? This is where the plot gets really out there. Who am I? Um, okay. I'm a descendant of Paracelsus, the scientist from Alan's Disc. The story of Paracelsus and the Philosopher's Stone is more than just a legend, it's real. This revelation that she's a descendant of Paracelsus got a chuckle out of me. She's so matter-of-fact about it. Rio's dad did research on the Philosopher's Stone years ago, but was shot by his research partner and killed. Rio's mother was also killed. Rio was shot, but survived. Answering the question earlier about that memory she brought up. It's a long scene that can fall into the melodramatic, but Lifeline's put the work in and getting me invested into Rio's story. As goofy as the game can be at points, there's a sincerity to it, something that many forms of media have pushed aside over the last decade or so. I know that Konami's only role in Lifeline was being its publisher for a Western release, but this section, a long exposition bomb, wouldn't feel out of place in a Kojima title. The final section is a nice change of pace, moving with zero gravity. Although the game does little with it, as we're in the final stretch. If you've been thinking, hey, I bet one of those monsters is actually Naomi, our girlfriend, then you would be correct. It's not meant to be a shocking twist or anything. Ryo brings us up before the reveal itself. Were you the one who brought me to my I did. I've been so scared. Thank goodness. Oh, Naomi, listen. I'm so sorry. And things continue to get even more out there. We talk to a brain connected to a machine, which turns out to be Rio's dad. He's been kept alive for years to help with the research on the stone, and we turn off the machine to end his torment. Again, this sounds quite out there, but it works because of how sincere it is and the emotion behind the scene. In Japan, there is a woman named Rio Honheim. I want you to find her and tell her her mother still lives. Tell her to find her mother. There's an account in her name at the Swiss Union Bank. Enough money there so she can have a good life. Will you do this for me? But there's still one missing factor. There was one survivor, a researcher named Joe Powers, that we came across earlier in the story. He's got the cackling villain laugh down pat. Would you like to know what you've done? <laughs> <laughs> you and the operator, you killed the girl that your operator was searching for. <laughs> so it turns out this guy, Joe Powers, was the one who shot Rio and was her father's research partner. He once again shoots Rio. 
the daughter of such a brilliant man. I'm amazed at how stupid you are. Joseph Kraft, my German birth name, translates to Joe Powers in English. Well, I'd better be off with the Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> <laughs> but she lives. When she was shot by Joseph years ago, her dad used the original Philosopher's Stone on her heart to heal her wound. He shot her in the heart then, he shot her again in the heart now. Good thing he didn't shoot her elsewhere like her face. But what if he shot you in the face? What if he shot me in the face? We have to destroy the station to get rid of all the created stones, which Joseph uses on himself to become a huge monster. For the final boss, we team up to take him down for good. We control one igniter, and we use voice commands to guide her with the other. A tough fight, but it's a great use of the voice mechanic in ending the game on a high note. Down. Down. Left. Left. Up. Up. Left. Left. With that, we set the self-destruct sequence and escape with Ryo. Can I say one last thing? Thank you. She could have also said Merry Christmas or You Truly Were My Lifeline and thus ends Lifeline, a fascinating, if frustrating, title. Its use of voice commands creates a different feel to a game on a number of fronts, one that helps it stand out all these years later. A title that tried things I wouldn't mind seeing again with the technology that's available now. So when I was streaming Lifeline, many people in chat brought up how a game like this could be done today. It's interesting to think about. It's been 20 years and there's been huge advances in technology. Lifeline uses voice recognition technology that was provided by the company Scansoft. Where is Scansoft now? Well, they went through a number of mergers since then and were acquired by Microsoft for nearly $20 billion in 2021. Their voice recognition technology was confirmed to be used by Siri in 2013. That technology is still not perfect, as anyone who can use them can attest, especially when you call a customer support line and you just want to talk to a damn person instead of going through 10 layers of menus, but they've come a long way since Lifeline. As of writing the script in February 2023, there's been an explosion of AI tools emerging for anyone to use. How these can or will be integrated into future game development is something that's going to be very fascinating to follow. With these emerging tools, you wouldn't need a huge budget to produce a voice recognition title. Indie devs, if you want to stand out from all those procedurally generated roguelites with survival and crafting elements or whatever is a dime a dozen these days with indie titles, consider trying something along the lines with Lifeline if it's feasible. I wonder how specific you can get with commands and how how they could react as a result. One thing I could see happening is how the character reacts. Like if we got angry with them or were mean to them, they'd be less likely to listen to us. There's none of that in Lifeline. Would there be an audience for something like this? Who knows? It wasn't like Lifeline was a huge seller. During the 360 and PS3 era, there was some experimentation with Kinect titles that didn't set the world on fire. But the technology is now there to really do something similar to Lifeline and growing on it. It still stands out as an interesting title trying different things with vocal commands. It doesn't stick the landing, but there there are a number of elements that work well, or could work now with the advances in technology. It's got that early 2000s charm and cheese to it. Time frame when larger developers took more risks as it was encouraged and more feasible. And there's something to be said of how the vocal commands create a different relationship with the world around you and the characters you're guiding. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, all those things YouTube likes. If you'd like to support the channel further, consider checking out my Patreon. You'll get periodic updates, you'll get access to videos earlier, and you'll be featured in the credits. Thanks everyone, Boulder Punch Out. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? A woodchuck would chuck as much as he could chuck if a woodchuck could. Okay, your turn. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? A chuck chuck wood chuck wood chuck, I don't know the rest. Wood chuck 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 wood chuck wood 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 chuck 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 wood wood chuck. Haha, nice try, but you blew it.